Okay, so I stupidly did not record the lecture from yesterday. I apologize for that. Um, we're gonna do, to, to make up for that, I'm gonna do a uh, makeshift lecture. This will be a little bit smaller, uh, but it'll actually be nice because we'll, uh, we'll get to see some of the demonstrations a little bit more close up. Uh, and also I won't burn out the light bulb in the first three seconds of class like I did in the actual class. So um, we also have that going for us. Um, so I have a, uh, a nice setup here, uh, which um, we're going to be using to talk about uh, AC current and uh, voltage uh, in AC circuits. So here we go. This is just a light bulb. Um, so the uh, AC in AC circuit just stands for alternating current. Uh, what it means is rather than uh, a typical circuit like we've seen so far, which has direct current that only flows in one direction, uh, now we have current that's going to be flowing either way. Um, so if I look at the circuit that I have here, I can have current flowing around through the right bulb, through the uh, light bulb um, to your left. I can then, it's then going to switch around and flow to the right. Um, this is typically how your power outlet in the wall works. Um, so if you look at the three-prong uh, plug uh, hole that you, you plug your electronics and equipment into, uh, generally that's uh, AC, an AC power source. So the current coming out of that wall socket, socket goes one way and then switches. And it switches direction uh, 60 times every second. Uh, we're not going to use the wall socket uh, directly because the light bulb I have here is pretty small. It would get burned out very quickly. Instead, what we're going to use is this power source right here. <clears throat> uh, this is an AC voltage source, so it's going to have an alternating voltage, which is going to create an alternating current in the circuit. And uh, right now, the voltage is turned off, which is why my light bulb is on. Uh, and the frequency is set to um, 1,000 hertz, which, is, uh, which means that the current would switch 1,000 times a second. So every second, the current would go back and forth 1,000 times. Um, I'm going to turn up the voltage, and you will see, assuming I am turning the right knob, which I am definitely not. I am not turning the right knob. I'm going to turn the voltage knob, that's the knob I want to turn, uh, to get some uh, actual current flowing in here. And you can see my light bulb starts to turn on. Um, that's great, uh, but you can't actually tell that this is going back and forth a thousand times a second. Um, and the reason we can't tell it's, not, it's going back and forth a thousand times a, a second is that a thousand times a second is way too fast uh, to see any sort of change in the brightness of the light bulb. Uh, we can fix that just by changing the frequency on here since I can adjust it. Uh, I'm going to go down. Right now I'm at about uh, a frequency of 10 hertz, which means this is flashing about 10 times a second. Or, excuse me, the current's going back and forth about 10 times a second. Uh, let's see what happens. Let's sl slow this down a little bit so that we can see. Uh, let's change the frequency to once a second, and we'll see what happens. I'm just going to turn this knob. We're going to go all the way down to once per second. You can see the flashing start to slow down. Here we go. I'm at I'm a little too far. There we go. That's a frequency a once a second. So what this means is that the current goes one way and then switches back once every second. And you can see the light bulb flashing pretty regularly here. Um, well, what does that mean? What does once a second mean in terms of the light bulb? Um, well, let's see if we can count. So you might expect that the light is flashing once every second. Uh, but it seems to be flashing a little bit more frequently so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, there's a clock in the back wall that you can't, guys can't see. Uh, I'm going to look up and I'm going to count uh, 10 seconds off. You guys count how many times this flashes, okay? We'll, we'll do audience participation even though this is uh, just a YouTube video. All right, here we go. And go. So that was 10 seconds. And you should have counted that this thing flashed twice uh, for every second. So you should have counted about 20 flashes in the 10 seconds that I was counting. 
Now, um, there's a reason for that. There's a reason why we're getting 20 flashes, even though our frequency, uh, we're getting two flashes a second, even though our frequency is only once a second. And if I, um, if I draw here a um, plot of my current as a function of time, um, I'm going to get something that looks like this. Um, so uh, because the signal coming out of here is sinusoidal, I'm going to get a current that is going to also look sinusoidal. It's going to go up and down once. And this is going to be one full period. Um, now, if I look at what the light bulb is doing at each of these times, well, when I start off, uh, there is no current. So here there's no current. There's no current here. And there's no current at the end of the cycle. So what that means is that at each of these spots, my light bulb is completely dim. There's no light coming off of my light bulb at those spots. However, over here I have a lot of current going through my circuit. Let's say I'm defining that voltage to be producing current uh, going to your uh, left in the video. So positive current means the current's going to the left. And negative current would mean the current is going to the right. So the light bulb itself does not care whether the current's going to the left or to the right. All it cares about is that some current is flowing in the light bulb. And that will mean that I am going to get current when I'm going to get a flash when the current's moving to the left. And I'm also going to get a flash when the current's moving. Um, so this is a plot of the uh, current as a function of time. Interestingly, we're still going to get the same plot when I plot voltage as a function of time. I'm going to get the exact same shape. The only difference is now I'll be measuring in volts. The reason I get the exact same shape is because if you see what we're plotting here, I look at the voltage across my light bulb. We know that that's just equal to the current times the resistance. So I should, if the current's going to be sinusoidal, the voltage drop across the resistor has to be the exact same sinusoidal function. The only difference is, again, my maximum and minimum values are going to be some maximum voltage here. And for my current, the maximum value is going to be some maximum current. So that, at the most simplest, at the most simple level, is what's going on uh, inside your circuit. You have the current going up and down. By going up and down, we mean the charges inside the wire are sloshing back and forth, uh, and they're doing that because the voltage that we're applying through this box right here is also uh, going up and down. So I have a high positive voltage, and then I have a zero voltage, and then I have a low negative voltage, and then it's just going up and down in a repeating cycle. Again, in your wall socket, the electricity, the voltage that's being delivered to that socket is doing that 60 times a second. Uh, it does that in the U.S. In other countries, um, they have um, a different, uh, both a different peak voltage and also a different frequency, which is why when you go to France or Senegal or um, you know, any other country in the world, uh, for the most part, uh, you're going to have a different wall socket and you need an adapter. All right, we just talked a lot about uh, why uh, or what happens when current's going back and forth. We saw the uh, light bulb flashing and uh, getting dimmer, uh, again, because there were times when we had a lot of current, when the current was very big, and then we had very little current uh, when the current was next to zero, and then sometimes we even had negative current, and that still produced a bright flash because the light bulb didn't care which way the current was moving. Um, now what I want to do is I want to... Um, keep with our mantra of what's going on in circuits and what we care about. Uh, we care about two things. Remember, what are the charges doing and then what is the energy doing? Uh, and since we care about those two things in particular, um, I thought we should look at that. So let's first look at what are the charges doing. Well, we already know that the current is going up and down. Um, but that would mean that uh, the charges are moving one way and then another. So we might want to ask, all right, on average, what are the charges doing? Um, so you could ask, well, what's the average current? 
Well, the average current, if half the time it's moving to the left and half the time it's moving to the right, then on average it's not going anywhere. Right? Basically, it's just like me, I'm going this way sometimes and then I'm going this way sometimes. And if I just keep doing this, I'm not going anywhere on net. Sometimes I'm moving forward, sometimes I'm moving backwards, but I'm not going anywhere. So on average, the net movement of the charge is going to be zero amps. So the average value of the current is not particularly useful for us to look at. Um, instead, we use this other value. Uh, we call this value the root mean square value. Um, or RMS for short. RMS just means root mean square. And the root mean square value works like this. I can't just take the average because I'm going to get zero. But let's say I were to square the current. Square the current. When I square the current, all of a sudden I'm not above zero half the time and below zero half the time. When you square anything, you always have to get a positive number. So I'm always above zero or at the very minimum, I'm, you, there are some spots where you'll have zero current. But on average, I'm going to be, have some number that's going to be non-zero, some positive non-zero number. Uh, so the first thing I do is I take the square, then I take the mean, mean is just a fancy math word for average. So I'll take the average, and then I still want to get uh, something that has units of amps. So I don't want to keep this squared because that would give me amps squared. So instead what I do is I take the square root of this. This is the RMS current. root mean square current, that's how I get it. Um, now, uh, I can do the same thing with the RMS, with the, with the voltage. I can get an RMS voltage. That would be the same thing. So the root mean square of voltage is the same thing. I'm going to take the square root of the average of the voltage squared. Now, you might wonder, well, how big is that? How big is the RMS current? You know, compared to some other current. Well, how big is it compared to, say, the maximum current, the peak in my sine wave, when I look at that alternating current curve that we had before? Well, it turns out that's just going to be I max over the square root of 2. And similarly, uh, the voltage is going to be V max over the square root of 2. So this is how big my root mean square current and voltages are. Um, and these are more useful quantities to work with than just the average. Um, we need to work with something uh, because we want to some, some way of quantifying how much current uh, is in the circuit and where charges are moving. Um, now that's the first part of our question. That's the what is energy doing question. This is, or sorry, what, is, uh, what are charges doing? This is all what are the charges doing? That's how they move through the current. What are the charges doing? Uh, we also have another question that we've been particularly concerned with, and that's where is the energy going? Now this is going to be particularly important because everything we plug into a wall socket, which is usually what we think of when we think of alternating current, um, all of that is consuming some energy. And we pay for that. Right? There's some uh, number of cents that you pay for every kilowatt hour uh, for every unit of energy that you use. Um, now you can save money by getting solar panels or getting uh, wind, uh, a wind turbine, um, but ultimately you're paying for that somehow. So uh, that's a very important question to ask, is how much energy are we using? So uh, to do that, uh, to consider that how much energy are we using question, um, we want to look at the power that our electrical instruments are consuming. Now we get on to our second question, which is, where does the energy go? How much are we using? And to answer this question, uh, we're just going to look at the power that our electrical devices use. Now, it's a little bit trickier than it was with just DC circuits, because it's not, they're not always using the same amount of power. Right? Because, just 
go back to our light bulb, right? The light bulb was not always on. So that means when the light bulb is on, it's using energy. When the light bulb is off, it is not using energy. So how much energy are we using on average? If we're going back and forth 60 times a second, we should be able to figure out some nice average for how much energy we're using. Uh, we should also be able to look at what peak energy use do we have? What's the most energy we're using at any instant in time? Um, well, as I said, to do that, we want to look at the power. We know that power is energy per unit time. And if I'm looking at something like a light bulb, uh, we already have an equation for how much power that light bulb is consuming. Uh, we said that the power is going to be using energy equivalent to the current squared times the resistance. Um, that was for direct current. That was the circuits we did before, where the current's only going in one direction. Now we have current that goes both ways. Current's going forward one way and then comes back, and it does that 60 times a second, switching very, very quickly. Um, so I want a way of measuring the, let's say I want to measure the maximum amount of power I get. Well, that would be the same equation, except I'm just going to plug in the maximum current that I'm going to get. The resistance is always the same, so that I don't have to worry about that ever being a maximum. Uh, but the current, uh, can go up and down. So if I want the maximum power I can get, that's going to be equal to the maximum current I get squared times the resistance. But generally, we're not going to be interested in the maximum amount of power we're going to get. We want to know what the average power we're going to get is. Um, because the maximum is only for a split second in time. It's right when the current's at a big maximum and then it starts to go down again. That's just for a fraction of a second. The more useful information we want is how much power are we using on average. Now, obviously, if this is the maximum power we're going to use, the average power we're going to use is going to be a bit less than that. And since half the time we're at the maximum and half the time we're at zero, what you find is that the average power that you use is going to be one half of the maximum power you use. So I'm going to put a big box around this. Actually, I'm going to leave a hole in my box for now because there's going to be different ways of writing this. Maximum power we're going to use is going to be one half, or sorry, the average power we're going to use, our average, is going to be one half the maximum power we're going to use. The other way of writing this is we just went over what the root mean square current is which is kind of like the average current, uh, except it gets rid of that pesky problem of the, um, the current, the average current being zero because it's above zero half the time and below zero half the time. But I can, I can just plug this in to this equation and write the average power in terms of the root mean square current. And if I do that, I'll get another formula for this. This will be IRMS squared times the resistance. In fact, I can do the same thing. I can use Ohm's law to write this a different way. Instead of writing it in terms of uh, the current and the resistance, I can write it in terms of the voltage in the current. So this would be equal to the IRMS times the voltage RMS. I could write it just in terms of the uh, RMS voltage. We had a bunch of different formulas writing this in terms of uh, current, voltage, and then resistance, writing the power in terms of those three quantities. Um, I am not going to go through all the different versions, different permutations. All you do is you just take one formula, take your definition of uh, what it means to be root mean square, and then take Ohm's law, and you can switch back and forth between all these formulas yourself. Uh, but I will put a big box around this, um, because this does uh, get us to the important question of where does our energy go in, a, in our circuits? Um, how much energy are we using when we plug anything into our wall socket? Okay, so we've talked about uh, how, to, how energy is used in an alternating current circuit. Uh, but we haven't quite finished how energy gets to your household appliances. Um, so how does it actually get to your microwave or your
Uh, and it turns out there's a little bit more than meets the eye uh, to that, because to do that you need, uh, to get the energy to your devi device, you need a transformer. So we have here, um, I'll try to get a close up of this in a little bit. Um, we have here cut open a, uh, a power supply, just a normal power supply, um, like you plug into your computer or uh, cell phone charger or what have you. Uh, you can see the, um, the plugs on here. Uh, and then you see a couple of coils going on in here. They look like solenoids uh, going around in this. And this guy is actually called a transformer. Uh, and a transformer's job is to transform uh, the voltage coming out of your wall uh, to the voltage required by uh, the thing that you plug into the wall outlet. So something like your oscilloscope, uh, which I know you all have oscilloscopes at home, uh, or uh, your TV, microwave, whatever electronic equipment you're looking at. Uh, the reason you need a transformer is because the current and voltage coming out of the wall socket is not necessarily the current and voltage that you need in your electronics equipment. Um, so I believe the wall socket operates at an RMS voltage of around 120 volts. If your um, hair dryer only needs 50 volts, uh, you're going to fry it if you try to put 120 volts uh, across it. So you want something that can transform the voltage that everybody gets from the wall socket into a voltage that uh, your particular electronic device happens to need. Um, and that's what this guy does. Now, um, to show how this guy works, um, we can use what we know about uh, solenoids, and particularly what we know about Faraday's law and Lenz's law. Um, so I have here, again, uh, my uh, AC source, which I can vary. So I can vary the frequency and the amplitude uh, coming out of um, going through this circuit. And all I'm doing is sending it into a solenoid. When I put a solenoid in a circuit, uh, we give it a different name. We call it an inductor. Um, inductors have uh, pretty interesting properties, uh, but our main role right here is looking at them for uh, how they work inside transformers. So right now, let's just figure out what's going on in our solenoid inductor here. Uh, so I have an alternating voltage on here that is uh, alternating at a frequency of 100 hertz. So 100 times a second, the current switches from going one way to the other way. So it's going around clockwise one second, uh, or one fraction of a second, and then a fraction of a second later, it's going around the other. It's going around counterclockwise. And when it does that, as you know uh, from, we know that moving charges create magnetic field. Um, so the moving charges in this uh, coil of wire is going to also create magnetic field. We can use our right hand rule to figure out the direction, but that doesn't really matter too, too much because the direction is constantly changing because the charges are going back and forth. Um, so as the charges are going around here, they create some magnetic field. Let's say the magnetic field is pointing this way one fraction of a second. Well, a fraction of a second later, it's going to be pointing the other way. So it's going to be going this way and then that way. This way, that way. This way, that way. 100 times a second, it's going to switch back and forth. Um, now that's, uh, that's great and all, but what can we use that for? Well, let's say I take my solenoid, which is producing a changing magnetic field going back and forth and back and forth, and let's say I put that inside another solenoid. So here's another solenoid I have right here. This solenoid is hooked up to the oscilloscope. Uh, you're going to get to play around with the oscilloscope later in lab, uh, but uh, basically its job is to plot the voltage as a function of time. And if I look over here, you can see I get a flat green line going across my oscilloscope screen. What that means is that the voltage in this solenoid, voltage going across that solenoid, and therefore the current in the solenoid is essentially zero. So we're going to use this to measure the electromotive force, or the voltage, that, this sol that is going on in the solenoid. And you can see it's zero, but let's see what happens when I put a changing uh, magnetic flux in. Let's see what happens if I put this primary coil inside. You can see all of a sudden I'm, start to getting, I'm starting to get a little bit of a sine wave. If I put this in even more, um, I get a pretty decently sized 
uh, sinusoidal wave of this particular voltage that's coming out. Um, now this is pretty powerful. Right? I have found a way, I should say, I shouldn't say I, uh, Tesla and other people found a way, um, to uh, transfer energy from one circuit to another circuit. So as soon as I do this, there's electromotive force, we see we get a sine wave in this solenoid, which means that this solenoid itself, this secondary solenoid, so we call this the primary since that's the one uh, that has the original voltage, the secondary solenoid has its own induced voltage, and we can use that voltage to run our electronics equipment. The nice part about this, the really nice part about this, is as I said earlier, we can actually use this to transform the voltage I have coming out of the primary coil, uh, coming out of your wall socket. Uh, we can transform that voltage into a different voltage. I can make it a bigger voltage if I want, or I could make it a smaller voltage. It depends on what your electronic device um, that you're interested in happens to need. Uh, that is exactly what these two coils are doing inside this circuit. It's a transformer. It transforms the voltage from um, the value, of, uh, the 120 volt value coming out of your wall socket to some other value um, that your device happens to need. Now, let's go over to uh, the blackboard and see how we can get different voltages out. Okay, so how do we transform from uh, the voltage go coming out of the wall socket to the voltage we actually need. Well, let's look at how the transformer actually works. There's only a few, uh, a few steps that are important here. Um, so step one, remember we had those two coils. Uh, I'll draw them over here. I'm going to call this coil one. Uh, and let's say coil two uh, is going around on the outside of that coil. This is coil two. So you've got your primary and your secondary coils. Um, step one is that we create a changing current in the in coil number one. So coil number one has some current coming in. And you've got a changing current in coil one. Uh, that changing current is going to create a magnetic field because we know that moving charges create magnetic fields. And since it's a changing current, that changing current is going to create a changing magnetic field. It's going to create a changing magnetic field, which we'll call B. Okay. The changing magnetic field is not only going through coil number one, it's also going through coil number two. So the changing magnetic field creates a changing magnetic flux in coil number two. So this is step one, step two. The changing magnetic field, that's going to create a changing magnetic flux in both coils one and two, but we're interested in coil two. So I'll say that's a changing magnetic flux, magnetic flux Vb in coil number two. We know from Faraday's and Lenz's law that that changing magnetic flux uh, is going to create an electromotive force inside coil number two. And that electromotive force can be used as a battery. Okay? So we've got a changing current, makes a changing magnetic field from coil number one. That changing magnetic field also passes through coil number two, so it creates uh, a changing, make that changing magnetic flux in coil two. And then finally, that changing magnetic flux is going to make an electromotive force in coil number two. So coil number two is basically going to act like its own battery. Now, the question is how much magnetic flux do we have? Uh, how much is, um, does coil two have compared to coil number one? 
So we know from Faraday's law that the electromotive force that we get, the voltage that's going to be applied to my circuit, is related to my changing magnetic flux. If I get, a, if I get more flux, I am going to get more electromotive force. I'll get a bigger voltage. Essentially, it's going to act like a bigger battery. Uh, all right, well, what determines how much magnetic flux I get? Well, each loop in my coil, each loop gets magnetic flux. So the number of loops is going to uh, be related to how much flux I get. If I have more loops, that's like the flux is coming through a bigger area which means more loops give me more flux. More flux means I'm going to get a bigger electromotive force. So here's what we do. It's a very simple formula. It's just related to the number of loops. So if I want to know what the root mean square voltage in my secondary coil is going to be, So this is actually, let me write it like this. This is the voltage uh, in the second coil, the secondary coil, the root mean square voltage in the secondary coil is going to be equal to the root mean square voltage in coil number one. But then I've got to account for how many loops we have, how many loops are in each coil. Uh, so I am just going to put here the number of loops in coil 2 and the number of loops in coil 1. That's the number of loops in coil 1. This is the number of loops in coil number 2. Again, by loop, I literally just mean how many loops in the helix of the wire, how many times, how many circles of wire do I make in that coil. That's all I mean by loops. If I have more loops, I get a bigger EMF in my primary coil. I could also go down in voltage. If I have fewer loops, uh, uh, I will have less voltage coming out than I had coming in. So I can transform, I can get a smaller voltage, or I can get a larger voltage. The last thing I want to talk about today uh, is a phenomenon called resonance. And uh, we talked very briefly about this phenomena in the context of, in the context of simple harmonic oscillators. So um, certain things in nature um, have an equilibrium position. And if you perturb them away from their equilibrium position, uh, nature tries to find a way to go back to them. So, for example, if I'm talking about a uh, mass on a spring and I push the spring down a little bit, the mass will start to go back and forth about its equilibrium position. Uh, it turns out that electrical circuits also have the equivalent of an equilibrium position. Uh, so I have here a capacitor. Uh, it's the little shiny blue guy uh, in front of the circuit that I've connected over here. And uh, that capacitor has its equilibrium position. Basically, its equilibrium position is not being charged. Um, and you can imagine that if I stretch, uh, that if I put charge on one of the capacitor plates, that's kind of like stretching the spring. If I put more charge on, it's stretching it. It doesn't really want to separate the charges and have them on different plates. It wants the positives and negatives right next to each other. Um, so, my capacitor is kind of the electronical, uh, electronic equivalent of a spring. Um, and when I put an inductor in a circuit, you can actually uh, observe the oscillations. Uh, so it turns out that if I have an LC circuit, uh, so inductors are given the symbol L, uh, capacitors have the symbol C, so we call it an LC circuit. The LC circuit has its own frequency that it likes to vibrate at. Uh, except here, the vibration is not a mass on a spring going up and down. It's the charges slash, uh, sloshing back and forth between different plates of the capacitor. So 
these are my capacitor plates, maybe my top plate has positive charge on it, and then the po positive charge will flow onto the bottom plate. So now the bottom plate has positive charge on it, and then it'll flow back to the top plate and have positive charge. So the charge is going to flow back and forth. Um, it turns out the frequency that they want to oscillate at depends on two things. It depends on uh, my capacitance, so how big or how strong of a capacitor I have. Uh, and it depends on how strong of an inductor I have. Remember, the inductor is just my solenoid. Inductor is just another word for the solenoid in the circuit. Um, so um, we can write this, we can call, we call the frequency that it wants to vibrate at the resonant frequency. So the resonant frequency tells me how many times a second the charges on the capacitor want to go back and forth. Um, and as I said, it's related to how strong of a capacitor I have and how strong of an inductor I have. Uh, and it has a pretty simple formula. It's 1 over 2 pi times the square root of L. L is the strength of the inductor times C. Again, L is just the strength of the inductor. That's the strength of the inductor. Um, so uh, now we can measure that, right? We can, uh, it's kind of like uh, anything that oscillates back and forth mechanically. Uh, so it could be like a mass on a spring, could be like a kid on a pendulum. Let's use that as an example. Um, so if you're a kid on a pendulum, and you're like, Mommy, Daddy, push me, push me. Um, you know, you, the goal is to go all the way around uh, the swing. Um, so if you're swinging back and forth on the playground, it's just like a pendulum in physics class, um, the goal is you want to go as, you want to swing as much as you possibly can. You want it as big of an amplitude as you can. Well, uh, there's two ways to get a big amplitude, right? You could push at, um, you could push really hard, but most parents are not going to be able to be strong enough to push their kids all the way around. Um, the other thing you could do is you could push at the right frequency. So it turns out the frequency that you push at has a big uh, influence on how high up you go. Um, now, we, we don't really think about that because we tend to push people naturally at the right frequency that gets you to a pretty big amplitude. Um, we push them at the fre same frequency that the swing is swinging back and forth at. So if the swing swings back and forth once a second, you're going to push the, the kid every time he comes to you, which will be once a second. So every time the kid comes to you, you push it back. And as they come back, you push them again. And as they come back, you push them again. Um, well, that's pushing at the natural frequency of the swing. Now, nobody said you had to push at that frequency. If you want to do a crappy job of pushing your kid, uh, you could push them once. You could push at a really low frequency. So you could push them once, go away for a week, come back a week later, and then push them again. If you do that, the kid's not going to get very high because you're pushing it. Uh, you're pushing too infrequently. You're pushing it too low of a frequency. Um, it's also bad to push too frequently. Right? It's also possible to push too frequently. So uh, let's say I push my kid, and then I push them like this. Right? I push them constantly. They're not going to go anywhere uh, with that frequency either. So it's possible to have too high of a frequency as well as too low of a frequency. You want to get just the right frequency. You want to get the frequency that matches the natural motion of the oscillation of the swing. The same exact thing is true for the circuit. The circuit has a frequency that it wants to push the charges back and forth with. If you deviate from that, the charges are not going to move as much. You're not going to get as much current. We can see that in this circuit here. Um, so I have set up an inductor. I set up a capacitor, so I get some resonant frequency because I have the strength of my inductor and strength of the capacitor there. Uh, I also have set up a resistor in the middle here. Um, all circuits have some resistance. This is just giving it a little bit extra 
Um, the reason I'm doing this is because by measuring the resistance, uh, it gives me a way to measure what the current is using Ohm's law. So if I know the resistance and I measure the voltage across the resistor, I can figure out what the current is. And we're just going to plot that on the oscilloscope. We're going to plot the voltage, but it's going to be the same graph as the current, or the same shape anyway, because of Ohm's law. So right now, I, uh, I have my frequency set for 1,000 hertz. Um, and I have my inductor and my capacitor here. And we've calculated the resonant frequency just by using this formula. And the resonant frequency for this particular circuit uh, is about 75, between 75 and 80 hertz. So I am well off of my resonant frequency. And if you look on my graph, you can see, uh, I can change the, um, the time spacing here, but you can see you've got a sine wave. Uh, and the sine wave is not, eh, you can see it's visible, but it's not hugely, hugely big. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go from the thousand hertz that we're currently pushing at. So that's like pushing your kid on the swing like this. way too frequently, You're pushing them a thousand times a second, when really you only want to push about 80 times a second. Uh, we're going to go down in frequency. We're going to see what happens to the amplitude of that sine wave. So I'm just going to go down like this. Do, 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 do. Now we're at about 150. And you can see my amplitude's already gone up quite a bit. I'm going to keep going up a little bit more. You can see at this point it's going to be harder to see. It's still going up a little bit. Now, just now, it looks like it's starting to go back down, and I'm at 68, so I've just passed the maximum. And if I, I'm going to change the time, I'm not changing the, the vertical scale, but I'm going to just change the, I'm just going to stretch out, uh, compress the graph a little bit, so it still looks like a sine wave. Um, I am just going to keep going down in frequency, and you can see it's, the graph is doing two things, one of which is the period is getting larger, because my frequency is getting smaller. But you can see my amplitude is also going back down. If I just rescale that, and I go down a bunch, you can see all of a sudden my amplitude starts to go away. Um, so this is this phenomenon of, of called resonance. Again, it's just like uh, any mechanical object where there's some equilibrium position. If you push it away from equilibrium, uh, it wants to go back to that equilibrium. My capacitor is just like a spring. It has an equilibrium state. The equilibrium state is when it's not charged. And it takes some energy to put the charge on. And when I connect it to an inductor, it has this uh, propensity for sloshing that charge back and forth. And I can get that charge to slosh around a whole bunch if I bring myself close to the resonant frequency, the frequency that the charges want to slosh around at anyway. Um, so my device here, all it's doing is pushing the charges around at a certain frequency. And if I push, in, if I push my charges at the frequency they want to be pushed at, you can see you get um, pretty high amplitude. Let me zoom out there. You get a pretty high amplitude uh, of current in your circuit, a pretty high maximum current. Um, all right, so that's it uh, for AC circuits. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, this, uh, this video is will work out at least as good as uh, just the, the regular uh, old straight up lecture. And that's it. Thanks for watching.